Hello and welcome back to Cinematic Universe, everyone. My name is Ernesto Martinez, and joining me again are the Robertsons. How are you guys? Great. Good. Thanks for having us back. Oh, of course, of course. Now we're going to have Sim City, A Dame to Kill For, by directed by Robert Rodriguez and Frank Miller, created by Frank Miller. Guys, take, take us off. Well, I, I thought it was a really great sequel, in my opinion. I'd say so. I thought it was a it was a cool sequel, but I thought it was uh, maybe even a cooler comic book adaptation. You know, I thought it it was uh, just a really great example of of bringing um, the comic book medium to life on on a silver screen. And uh, I thought it had some bumps in the road. There was there was some problems, but I think overall. Uh, I think this film really uh, had had a lot to offer visually, and uh, it was it was a really good sequel. I agree. I was watching Sin City, and everybody found out that I haven't seen it since it came out. Yeah, because twenty minutes in, I'm watching it with my dad, and all of a sudden he can't handle it, and he's waiting <laughs> for and he's waiting for me to tell him that I can't handle it. So three minutes later, I said, "Let's get out of here. I don't know what the hell we're watching." <laughs> so ever since, since since 2005 I only had the first 20 minute scene and everybody, every time somebody asked me I'm like yeah 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 I saw it I saw it I saw it I just couldn't tell them that I didn't because <laughs> it was a lot of a Sin City enthusiast that I just ran, ran into so I had to you know say yeah 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 and I saw it again and I found it pretty pretty good I like the style cartoonish style visually it was kind of cartoonish but still had his entertainment the marv story was one of the better stronger parts of the first movie and the bruce willis scenes now agreed yeah now one question for dame to kill for the in the books does it kind of reboot itself with the characters because marv comes back and we know what happens to him in the first one and and they flesh out his story even further Right. So they just bring them back just because, without paying attention to continuity, or just for the hell of it. Well, it's a mix max, uh, mix matched chronology. To, um, for instance, the Dame. I know the actual Dame to Kill for story takes place before the majority of the first Sin City film. Okay. Um, although that's not completely specified. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Dwight already has his new face in his story in the first Sin City. Right, so all that right. has happened prior. Exactly. Well, the Josh Brolin version of Dwight is prior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think it's an interesting choice by Robert Rodriguez, I think, to – and I mean Frank Miller. I mean it's, since it's co-directed um, to, to present the, the, um, the kind of odd chronology with each individual segment. Mm. I think uh, – I get the feeling that it's kind of been confusing to some. And I think even, the chronology even gets kind of confusing – with the last story, the Nancy Marv story. Yeah. But, I, but I've got some theories on that I'll save for later. But, um, yeah, it's, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's worth pointing out, too. Frank Miller is kind of in that department of writers like um, Alan Moore, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, to some degree Grant Morrison of that era, who just they like chronology and canon for comics, but I, I think they're also big fans of not being held to any previous works and kind of – rebooting a material every time they write it where i mean things like are many comics do in general yeah they mm-hmm. reboot characters reuse them in different circumstances all the time right like very comic book genre or just ignore know. things even yeah, yeah you know for the sake of the story basically frank miller i've been getting to know a lot of his previous and later work this year because i've been watching a lot of uh on blip tv.com i've been watching this internet critic linkara and he just takes a lot of bad comics per se Mm -hmm. and he just uh rips them a new one or he points out the flaws and say if it was a good comic a bad comic Mm -hmm. and he reviewed a lot of frank miller's later stories like holy terror yeah (laughs) which as soon as i saw it was wow can't believe he actually wrote that (laughs) Oh, yeah. And then he's doing the Batman and Robin All-Star book series, which I found that okay, just felt re- very repetitive in the dialogue. But for Sin City, 
now that I know Frank Miller more than I did before, all of his tropes are there. You had the the dames, of course, the his his kind of a signature to have a lot of female prostitutes mm -hmm. in a way. Because I know in Batman Year One, Catwoman starts off as a prostitute and then yeah. slowly evolves into a hero. And here you have a bit of both. They're prostitutes, but they're also anti-heroes. Mm -hmm. And they serve their own uh, purpose. Because, you know, cops can't get into the... Oh, old uh, town. Old town, yeah. Cops can't get in there because of a deal that they have with the prostitutes. And if one goes in, all hell breaks loose. But yeah, that's the basic gist of Frank Miller. So, Dame to Kill for the Dame in question played by... Eva Green, mm -hmm. and she is a dame. I gotta say it. I, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she had no lines, and she just went in there and started talking, and they just recorded her because it just felt so natural, and it, it vexes one. It really did vex, does vex a viewer because it's so easy for her. No, oh, it's one of the two or three best performances in either of the Sin City films. It's um. You know, I think uh, Eva Green deserves a lot of credit. Um, there's not a lot of actors that understand how to, or who are natural with comic book style dialogue, especially by a writer of such a distinct style as Frank Miller, where Frank Miller is very melodramatic, very st highly stylized. And mm -hmm. Green gets it the way that Mickey Rourke and uh, Bruce Willis get it. And the way that in the way that very few actors in the genre do. And I mean, she showed the same kind of understanding earlier this year in 300 mm -hmm. uh, rise of an empire where she just really gets the material. It gets the tone and plays it both authentically, emotionally and psychologically, but also can bring camp to the part. She's definitely become this generation's femme fatale for sure. She plays that well. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, she's, there's something really old fashioned, Oh, definitely. Marlena Dietrich kind of Greta Garbo kind of thing where it's like piercing eyes. Right. Yeah, I knew from the moment she appeared in Casino Royale that this woman's going places. I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know where, but there's something about her. It's almost poetic the way she's acting and then you see the visuals adding to her performance because there are parts where she's completely disrobed She's just standing, looking outside a window, and you can't take your eyes off her. And uh, this is that's uh, I thought that was some of the best work in the entire movie. And, and something I really appreciated more than anything else was um, I felt a real understanding of um, of Frank Miller's view on, on sexualized female characters. I think sometimes it gets lost that Miller uh, usually presents these women in a way where they are accountable for their own objectification and in control of it. Mm -hmm. um, if they're perceived sexually, it's because they choose to be it. And, and they have a, a power and they, they sort of attack the submissive role that objectification is supposed to have on them. You know, I mean, this really goes back to Miller's daredevil work with Electra, who's a sexualized character, but he's completely assertive and, you know, completely responsible for her yeah. own fate. It's almost like it's self-aware of... Completely. Exactly. And so are the prostitute characters in, the Sin, in Sin City, where it should be a bad thing that their sex objects are prostitutes, and yet they're completely in control of their own fate, completely in control of, of the power that their sexuality and, their, and the chains that society would put on them. Mm. And they took over a whole town right, to serve right. their purpose. Yeah. They have power clearly with the police and the government, and that's not typical of a prostitute usually when you think of a prostitute you think of someone who is the opposite is very out of control or un in control by someone else and and even though you know in the first film you do get a little bit of that with what's her name alexis i don't remember from gilmore girls mm -hmm. oh yeah uh, alexis Spidell but she's very that. young so it seems like she was by far kind of the youngest one but all the other older adult prostitutes seem very in their element. It's not something that, you know, makes them a victim. They're predators in their own right. And it's also because I think too, that that's a really good point that they're, they're dominant in their own way because society has given women these roles, quote unquote, where it's like a woman is either 
you know, in, in, in a way, Eva Green is a prostitute, too, as a trophy wife or whatever, you know, but it's like society may say that she can only fit into this role. She sort of violently strikes back against that role. You know, Miller does the same kind of thing with Wonder Woman, actually, and um, um, the Dark Knight strikes uh dark Knight strikes again and then in his batman and robin series where he presents wonder woman is sort of violently opposed to like male society and kind of the the shackles it puts on women and it's it's interesting because it's miller engages in exploitation yet mm-hmm. subverts it I think with a surprisingly sensitive portrayal and sometimes i can kind of understand that viewpoint because if you don't write it right then you're just you just have a slab of meat there that's just standing around I'm not doing a damn thing. I think too the work that really makes me kind of take that perspective is is uh, like a Frank Miller work like Martha Washington, which has like a strong female protagonist, you know. And, and in in essence too, it's um, I like how Eva Green is literally called goddess. Yeah. You know, it, in one way, it's presented as how beautiful and influential she is, but then it's also how much power she actually does hold in the situation, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's that weird balance I think Miller has between message and exploitation. Well, even if you scale it down, even the first one, look how the power that Goldie has on Marv. Just one night together, and he's completely in love and obsessed with her, and you know, takes him somewhere totally he wouldn't be if he hadn't met her. He's willing to do all these things. You know, so it's like it's interesting. You've got Eva Green's character, who she even says, you know, I. I I won't have, this will be the last time that I have to make my way on my back. So in that, in, like you said, it's, it's sort of like a prostitution in its own way, mm-hmm. being a trophy wife and using, you know, willfully using your sexuality to manipulate others. And then you've got Gail, who's, you know, the head prostitute in Old Town. And she, and you know, is clearly a very powerful, you know, leader that you don't want to mess with. And then you've got Nancy, who is also, you know, it's just different levels of sort of the same thing, like basically prostitution in a way. And Nancy's not quite a prostitute, but being a stripper usually is, a people say, a gateway into prostitution for some people. And in Nancy's case, yes, she's on that level, but she has complete control over the crowd. They're wrapped around her finger, so mm-hmm. she feels like she's in control in, in that element, and the same female roles you have in that film are kind of different tiers of what someone would normally find as, you know, a woman that doesn't have power or is submissive, and then you, it's kind of turned on itself, or actually they do have power, and they're the ones actually in control. Yeah. It's just interesting. Completely, and then, and then each of these women is kind of representative of something to each of these characters, you know, like you were mentioning. You know, for instance, like Nancy is, is a kind of, uh, is the personification of innocence, to Hardigan and his his worldview that he desperately needs, or Goldie is the personification of kindness to Marv, uh, and not it's not even just about sex. Or it, it's interesting these these sexualized women represent something much more deep and personal to these hardened and, and damaged men. Yeah, and it's kind of a it's a classic film noir element, kind of played to. It's hyped up, like hype, yeah. mm-hmm. like yeah. it's got like a little steroid increase in right. its execution. The only thing about Sin City 2 that, I, I, at least with the first one, I kind of got it. I got the point, both visually and the story. Here I felt the energy was kind of like going up and down in between the in between the stories with Marv, Nancy. I know that the Joseph Gordon-Levitt character was newly integrated to the... Yeah, that's, that's an original. Yeah, and the Powers Booth story with... Uh, Eva Green's the the Dame, because once we get to the last part, Nancy's story, I, that's where the energy for me personally kind of disappeared, and I'm just sitting there waiting for it to be over because I couldn't take it. I'm like, just please stop, stop. I can't. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't. I think it's the weakest part of the movie. I personally do. I think I think it has some. Well, part of me feels like it doesn't come together, and then part of me actually wonders how much of it is supposed to exist like actually be happening in the world. I think very early really? on, well, very early on, they set that whole, they have the whole setup with Hardigan's ghost or whatever. So I wonder how much of our perception of that story is reliable. And, you know, Frank Miller is very famous for his hallucination stories mm-hmm. for characters too, you know, or, or where a, per- a character's perception of a story 
our perception of an event can cannot be reality. So I, I'm debating that one still, but I, I agree. I think it's the weakest. Yeah, chapter. because in the trailers you have all this battle and explosion. Josh Brolin's character is, is teaming up with with Marv, and I for some reason expected Nancy to also team up with him to go after Powers Booth, and then Ava would be on Power Booth's side, and it would be the whole Power Mayhem kind of climax, and no, we just had Nancy. I don't know, just the way you expected it to go down, and it didn't go down, so it was kind of disappointing, because you had this build-up with Powers Booth's character, and the best build-up was between him and his bastard son, which is played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. It's like, power is a good thing, or greed. Let's, <laughs> let's play this game. I'm like, God, I love this character. It's a pretty good Powers Booth. Buddy. Exactly, and and to end it on a weak story, it just took me out. Which I, I'm like, God damn it! You, know, you almost had me there. I'm like, it did seem a little disjointed. I would agree with that. A little mod podge, vignette. You know, I did. I definitely felt like the first one had a stronger through line. It just seemed to weave together a bit better. It just seemed like a stronger story. But I almost would rather view them as companion pieces than, I mean, kind of one in the same film, like just the second half of the story, basically. Because I, I like the idea, like, I don't remember who you told me, Ben, some critic or someone said that the film was uh, was joyless. I don't remember who yeah, yeah. quoted that. I don't, I don't know how you call it joyless when it's its whole purpose. It's joy is in its cinema verite, in its approach, mm -hmm. the way it's shot, the way it's edited, the way it's stylization i mean it's a dark story it's called right. sin city what are you expecting to happen just off the title alone not knowing anything about it mm. but even then i i am okay with it if, if joyless is a critique then i'm actually okay with it being joyless because real if it's something so stylized but it deals with a lot of realism realisms that are in the world and what people are dealing with inside as well as politics and such and I feel like if you are going to take what's happening to these people realistically, and none of them really have good outcomes or mm -hmm. a happy ending. It's basically what, I mean, you have people, you know, like Nancy who go on, who goes on the suicidal quest for revenge. Uh, Hardigan shoots himself. Uh, you've got Joseph Gordon, Joseph Gordon Levitt's character again, going on another basically suicidal sort of revenge mission i mean everybody you've got eva green who may have loved really actually loved white but her greed consumes her and she gets to a past a point of no return mm. so i mean i feel like it, it definitely it seems appropriate what happens to people if you were in nancy's position and you've been almost raped and tortured and went through all that chances are things probably aren't going to get better for you in life if you're staying in sin city in the same strip club doing the same thing chances are your life's not going to get better it's probably going to get worse so i feel like their their journeys emotional and personal journeys are apt to the situation of sin city mm. so i feel like it was an appropriate second you know sequel to that first story if you're going to really kind of stick with the same emotions and events and things that they're going mm -hmm. through i feel like yeah i mean it's it's going to be a hard movie it's Joyful wouldn't necessarily be the first way I would think to describe even the first one, even though I thought it was better. You know, I just, right. I, I think uh, kind of not knowing what you're going into if you're going to kind of expect that out of it. Well, I think I like the way you, you worded that too, because it's um, a sequel that it's really comparable to, if you even want to call this a sequel, would be like Kill Bill Volume 2, mm -hmm. where it's. Um, when you view what Kill Bill was supposed to be, the film is like kind of a variation on different tones of grindhouse films. So it has like it's it's fundamentally the same kind of thing, but it's it's variation in, in sort of approach and mood. And and I think Sin I think the Sin City films are a lot like that. You know, where the the first Marv story has shades really heavy shades of horror. Um, and uh, I'm talking about the first Sin City, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Elijah Wood cannibal story. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, of course I'm, escaping me right now. Kind of sorry. Or like, but for uh, sure. right, and then there's elements of overt film noir, um, you know, and then at times it really embraces the comic book genre into becoming near superhero. It's it's it's, um, and I think that's that's a hallmark of Frank Miller in general is he's 
he's always really embraced the the different approaches we do to express certain anxieties. I mean, you, you mentioned Holy Terror before. I mean, Frank Miller went into that literally saying, because this is propaganda. He's like, there's no Iraq propaganda, and we've always tried. I mean, his original idea with that was obviously to have Batman fighting the Taliban. And he, and <laughs> I'm so the, glad he did. it didn't end up being Batman. Just, oh, I, I wish, I, see, I'm the opposite. I wish he would have been able to do <laughs> shot with it because it, it just goes to show you know you had Batman fighting the Japanese and the Germans in World War II well why not if Iron Man can date you know celebs and stuff but right. like, and Tim Gunn can be his consultant right. why not approach have the a, real world well, yeah, why not have a, if you want to if Nolan's Some, making it in, in film more realistic why can't you make it you know in, in literature don't, I mean, don't ignore the propaganda I, I admire that Miller is like has always been that America is really built off exploitation genre fiction. That we were fans of violent, sexualized stuff that is oftentimes very intelligent, but it is violent, sexualized, and exploitive. Mm. And uh, I think Sin City really kind of keeps that balance constantly. It's like never too exploitive to be, or it's never too exploited to just be purely about nothing, but at the same time, it's, it's so exploited where you're not like, oh, this is a satire. Oh, yeah, like, what were you mentioning the other day about the nudity? That it was well-used nudity. Oh, that was well-used it, nudity. Yeah, it's like... It never seems too exploited. exploited. It always it's, had a purpose to a degree. It's like, yeah, she's naked because she's beautiful, but she's also naked because she's powerful. It, it's like the nudity serves a, a similar purpose to, to Dave Gibbons illustrations in Watchmen. You know, where it's like Dr. Manhattan's nude because... Why would he need clothes? Well, his power is... This is the purity of his power. He's a god, you know? And it's like, in this instance, it's like Eva Green. She's a god. You know, she's kind of beyond it. It's, it's sort of a literalization of, um, of some of the things said about her character early in the piece. And, and, and I like that. That's a comic book approach. It's a very graphic film. It was very godlike when she was in that water and oh, yeah, the yeah, heat's yeah. all around her and she looks just like some serpent goddess. No, oh, completely, yeah. It's revitalizing a, herself. Yeah, you see her like turn around in the in the pool. It's like she's almost hovering in air except for the few yeah. small bits of, of lines that are that show that it's supposed to be water. Yeah, like the ripples of the water right. and the vapors from the heat off of it. Yeah, I mean it's it, I mean, it's worth pointing out. I mean, Frank, it, it, it really delivers not just Frank Miller's writing style but a lot of the storytelling Frank Miller has done with his illustration. I mean, he's one of the great modern American comic book illustrators on top of, of what he's done with his writing. And it's, the film does a good job of kind of carrying those anxieties and themes and ideas that Miller re regularly presents in his work and, and taking and transferring it from a graphic form to a, to a cinematic form. The one part that just never clicked well with me is uh, Dwight, since, since, since Clive Owen didn't come back, they brought in Josh Brolin. And I know one of us mentioned that, well, not us, you guys, mentioned that Dwight at one point has facial reconstruction in the comics. And then you see him in a scene where he comes out of a train and he they're trying to make him look like Clive Owen in a way with yeah. the hair and everything. So I guess before that scene, he looked like Josh Brolin would look and then at that <laughs> point, that's where Dwight looks like Dwight from the first movie. That's where they were trying to do what, right? Like, I right. think so. Yeah. Because they look kind of weird, and that was like a big no-no for me. I'm like, okay, you try to make them look yeah, like Clive Owen. Yeah. And also, I think there's that kind of loose interpretation to it where it's uh, that maybe he's even changed his face and how he's supposed to look in, you know, in the original film. Hmm. But the notion that Dwight's had a lot of work done and that no one recognizes him. You know, I mean, it's... You we know, can, again, but yeah, kind of a fickle timeline. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not a perfect makeup job. I would agree. Yeah, I mean, it looked kind of strange. And what to me, it wasn't too distracting, but yeah, it, I mean, it was definitely odd. Right, it, it's weird. The film actually has several bits of recasting, and mm. uh, like Miho, Miho, Miho's not back, and uh, Manut, um, Dennis Haysburg. Yeah. yeah, Dennis Haysburg. Yeah, I, and, I, uh, he was great. I mean. Yeah, I really liked him. I didn't, I I didn't feel you can get a big guy in a way to fill in Michael Clark Duncan's shoes because that was a big dude, but oh, Dennis yeah. does it just with voice alone, so that was great. I actually think uh, Duncan really delivers like the physical presence in the first film. It's really kind of creepy. Right. 
And he does have a deep, deep voice, too. Exactly. But yeah. then Allstate guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then Dennis Hayes. Right like, in there. Yeah, I think Dennis Hayes has kind of creepiness to his performance that seems a little more... It really catches the Frank Miller style. It, it actually reminded me a lot of Benicio Del Toro's performance. Oh, I loved his performance. It's, mm, it's just it's so, kind of unsettling. It's like Something's the eye, not right. right, right. The eye gestures, the subtle hints in the voice really get the nuances of Frank Miller's writing style. And I was like, okay, that was that was a, it was a, it was a better than lateral move. I would definitely say. Yeah. So yeah, the really negative parts for me in this movie were some of those stories, the Nancy story, and some of those little nitpicks here and there that just can't be ignored. Because I feel those other parts, you could easily write them out. And they can be their own little story for like a YouTube series or something like that. And you could have just mashed up the rest of the movie. Take out Powers Booth from the Nazi story. Put them in there with Ava and have a ball. But, yeah, I, I kind of, this is me personally. I would put Sin City, Dame to Kill for in the first one on the same playground like the same level they have their ups and downs but at the same time they both achieve what they're in their intended their intended mission which is represent uh, the noir mm -hmm. the female characters their empowerment that yes this is for a purpose yes this is supposed to go somewhere no we're not doing it because even though we kind of are <laughs> and i'm gonna say that in both movies they try, and they really do, make Sin City a character. Kind of like Gotham City is his own character. Yes, yes. I felt a few more stylistic choices would have made that even better. But when you see the two of them as a whole, they try to achieve Sin City as the main character. And everyone's just playing on Sin City's playground. Right. 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 Yeah, that's a great point. Because everybody like keeps coming back to Sin City. And it was... In and out of Sin City. So you kind of get that like everyone you know it zooms out it has all the buildings and everything and then it zooms out to the graphic sin city so i like that it's the idea that everyone is just a rat in the maze that is right. Sin city yeah because well, <laughs> the buildings did kind of look like a little labyrinth and everyone's just yeah. trying to find their way it's like in a prison. town yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. A yeah, because I know that since the whole movie is black and white and it uses a lot of hard lighting and shadows you could have really gone even crazier with the shadows and it does a few times that wonderful shot of ray liotta where his eyes oh are yes his eyes. Eyes. Woo! just for that scene alone just give the man his props that was amazing oh so that good was, was it's like ray liotta playing ray liotta it's a little crazy yeah it's like you're gonna have to make me do what i gotta <laughs> do i'm like jesus christ <laughs> these guys can <laughs> And, and that really, actually, I did want to bring up is I thought Ray Liotta and Christopher Lloyd and Chris Maloney were absolutely fantastic in these little small roles. And kind of scene stealers, really. Yeah. I've seen more of all of them. Yeah. I think it was, it's great that those were short because I feel like you would have dragged them out it could have lost its novelty. So I'm glad they were as Good quick point. and precise as they were. It's true. Right. Because Maloney's not a big star name, but... When he does deliver, he does it in small, small pieces. Christopher Lloyd, I think that's the first time I ha I heard him, or I've seen him do a role like that. I'm not well versed in, in Lloyd's films, but I'm like, oh shit, he's gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. Back to the future's out of here. Nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah. And then you have Ray Liotta, because I know what I'm gonna get from Ray Liotta. I wasn't expecting it to be so freaking perfect. Yeah, uh, just yeah, nailed it. So yeah, I would rate Dame to Kill for about the same or just a slightly little lower than the first one. So it's 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 better instead of seeing it as sequels, just seeing it as this whole one movie. That's it works better as a complete two hour and eighty minute like three hour film. Put it that way, it works better as a three hour film than that nine year gap because the the nine year does hurt it a little bit. Yeah, that's a long time. I was just thinking about that. My ten year high school anniversary is next year and i remember arguing about it in an eighth grade creative writing class with my teacher she didn't like it and i was trying to get her to realize how awesome it was and yeah. she was like oh it's it's just a play on noir it's not really noir and i was like it can't get more noir <laughs> city and that and you know that's interesting because that's 
you know, as I rate it, I think it's worth pointing out that it's not just noir. That's the beauty of Sin City, I really think, is it's, yeah. uh, it's such a primitive view of the way Americans approach their genre fiction. You know, it's like a, it takes noir and brings it back to expressionism, takes detective stories and bring, you know, brings it back to this primitive state. Hipster noir. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, it's incredible stuff. But, uh, Take that, Miss Martin. That was right over well, It is awesome. <laughs> and since I interrupted, I apologize. What would, what, would, what would be your rating? I apologize since I stole your rating. Well, I would say the first would probably be a, a four out of five. I mean, when I saw that movie, it was honestly, I, I it was one of the, one of the few movies that I saw, especially because I was young when I saw it. It really kind of changed. It was a game changer for me. I think it was one of the first, especially comic book movies. Um, that I thought was really on a next level. Because uh, this is before I saw Watchmen, I believe. Yeah, yeah, um, and that really took it to a next level for me. But before that, it was kind of the earlier 90s comic films that I saw that were still trying to find their place in the genre of what it, how do we handle a comic book film. So they were kind of a little awkward and you know had a rough start there. Um, so Sin City, I think, was probably the first uh, comic book genre film that was just like, wow this is what it, this is about. And it, it kind of really transported me. So I was really blown away by the first one. Saw it several times in theaters. Just obviously was talking it up to everybody. So I would probably say that's a four out of five. And I would say this one's probably um, three and a half or so. Maybe maybe three. I yeah. have to see it again. Through, but around that range. I mean, I, I thought it was a good contender, a good companion piece. But uh, I would definitely say the first, to me, was just stronger overall. I think that's fair. Um, I'm along the same lines. I, I, I would give it a, a 4 out of 5 or a B plus. Mm -hmm. I think it has both the weakest story of uh, both the Sin City films and the Nancy story. But I also think it has two the best one in my personal opinion is the Dank to Kill for the Eva Green uh, Josh Brolin story and I would honestly put the, the Joseph Gordon Levin, uh, Levin segment as one of the two or three best ones. I thought it was such a nuanced and small story that really reflected so much of the town. I thought that was amongst the best moments in the franchise. I think uh, Mickey Rourke is still great. Um, yeah. I think it was. it's nice to see Powers Booth in things. I mean, he's <laughs> he was a good yeah. actor. There was a lot of... It was some, and the thing is, too, is it can't be stressed enough. There's some really cool, artistic chances taken in this film. It's not just like, let's adapt a comic book. It's, there's a real attempt to make the graphic storytelling form cinematic and for that alone it makes me look, overlook some of the bumps especially in the third act the, the nancy story which i think we all agree is kind of the weakest point but i would give it a four out of five or a b plus all right well thank you for joining me again my name is ernesto ben nadia do this again sometime Great. thank Thanks. you Thanks for having us. Oh, thank you bye-bye